Thank you. You've only got me for half the session now, so I'm nearly, you're nearly done with me, so you'll be pleased to know that. So, great opportunity to talk about the heat uh, um, here. It's great to do it in the right environment. Trying to do this in the cold and the whatever of, of the UK is much more difficult to convince people that it's important. Why is it important? Well, athletes will tell you it's about impairing performance, and the physicians will tell you about is the heat illness and managing those people that collapse. So we come from slightly different aspects, but it's really important for both issues. And so what I'm going to do for the first part of the talk is just talk about some of the issues around um, thermoregulation, particularly for people with an impairment. And then Sebastian's going to talk about some of the strategies that you can use in terms of acclimatization and, and, and uh, cooling strategies to help uh, prevent this occurring to help maintain performance and uh, reduce heat illness. So to lose heat, there's, there's four ways that we do that from the skin, through radiation, uh, convection, uh, evaporation and conduction. So the four methods of, of, of heat loss from the skin. Now while we're all sitting here at rest, 60% of the heat we're losing is just by radiation. So we're just blowing it away into the environment. But when we exercise, that changes. So 80% of heat loss is by evaporation. So it's a big change between the, the person who's sitting and the person who's exercising. And that's really important as we go on to consider some of the limitations in terms of some of the different impairment types. So we're constantly fighting this thing between heat we gain from the environment and from the metabolic uh, activity that's under undergoing and how we lose heat. And that's what helps to maintain our body temperature in the status quo. So we like to maintain a body temperature at kind of a standard, within a standard range. And at rest, we produce about 1.25 to 1.5 kilocalories per minute. But when we exercise, that goes up dramatically. So suddenly we've got this, this thing where muscle, which is so inefficient in terms of mechanical energy, produces an awful lot of heat energy. And actually we're exercising and producing this vast amount of heat into our body, which we need to dissipate. So exercise increases the demand for blood flow to muscles. The exercising muscles generate heat. This heat uh, is dissipated by increasing blood flow to the skin. And we tend to set up this competition between blood flow to muscle, blood flow to skin. And so we get impaired performance or we risk developing heat illness. There are not many, that many studies looking at uh, the effect of exercise and thermal stress. This is one of them. Um, but I would say to comment on this study that particularly the exercise intensity is fairly low. And so at 55 to 60 percent of VO2 max, so there was some difference in in um, uh, heart rate responses in the paraplegic athletes. But uh, uh, the study I don't think was particularly representative of the sporting uh, performances that we see in in uh, these sort of games. But we come on to the group of athletes who have the most challenges in terms of uh, exercising in hot environments, and those with spinal cord injury, and. When we look at someone in a wheelchair, we see the physical impairment. We see that they can't move. But we don't necessarily see all the underlying physiological factors that are going on. This peripheral receptor mechanism uh, loss function. So where they can't detect uh, the temperature below the level of the lesion. Their effect on their autonomic control of sweating. Their loss of ability to control the uh, appropriately vasoconstrict or vasodilate the peri peripheral vasculature and a different regulatory uh, set point. So what tends to happen is that you tend to drift towards the uh, ambient temperature uh, of the environment that you're in. And the extent of that impairment uh, on, on thermoregulatory thermo function relates to the uh, uh, level of spinal cord injury and the lower most functioning sympathetic nervous uh, components. So below the level of a spinal legion, so I have a C7 legion, incomplete, but I have no sensory uh, uh, therm uh, thermal sensation below that level. So there's only spinal reflex sweating that occurs there. It's, it's a very low rate, and that's usually insufficient to regu regulate body temperature during thermal stress of exercise. So this basal sweat rate, rate that occurs below the, the, the lesion, it's unaffected by activity or ambient temperature. But then you then take someone with a high spinal lesion and they get them to exercise and what happens is they start sweating quite profusely above the level of the lesion. And uh, a study by Jerry Petrosky and colleagues in the US found that that sweat rate can increase about sixfold. 
And the problem with that is you've got this high sweat rate above the level of the lesion, which then drips off, and dripping off sweat isn't very helpful for heat loss, because for heat loss we need evaporation. So you get this not much happening below, and in ineffective uh, um, heat loss occurring above the level of the lesion. So we've got these issues related to uh, people with spinal cord injury, but also people with multiple limb deficiency have reduced surface area for heat loss. So in a hot environment, that can be challenging to lose heat sufficiently. And also there can be problems with monitoring, uh, uh, problems with monitoring your hydration status or just accessing fluid. So with a visual impairment, we used, to, uh, uh, we used to teach our athletes about monitoring hydration to look at urine color. And if you can't see what color your urine is, you need quite a good friend to be able to say, could you just have a look at my pee and tell me whether it's dark or not? Um, you know, you need, if you're going to use daily weight, uh, measuring, looking at weight loss on a daily basis to look at hydration status, you need to have scales that someone with a visual impairment can you know, maybe have talking scales or whatever. So you need to think around things, how people with severe care needs access fluids and so on. So there are other issues that Paralympic athletes have. And we need to think about hydration, uh, you know, looking at how we maintain the balance of water within the body uh, between the daily water input and the daily water output. So exercising in the hot weather, the output increases, and we need to try and shift that balance. So what I'm going to just talk about is a little study that we did looking at how, uh, how that uh, um, impact of exercise and being in a hot environment can have an effect on a Paralympic athlete. What happens is when we exercise our sweat rates increase and um, their sweat rates have been seen in some able-bodied athletes as up to 3.7 liters per hour. I think the highest recorded sweat, sweat rate uh, from marathon pre to post was in Alberto Salazar of nearly four liters per hour. And we can only replace that fluid at a certain rate and that's largely determined by the rate of gastric emptying. So in our body, we turn over water, and that's between the balance between the stimulus for thirst and urine output, producing a daily turnover in our body of water. And that's influenced by various factors, the physical activity, the environment, but also losses in the, in the gastrointestinal tract. So if we can monitor that, we can look at how we, uh, uh, someone, someone is adapting to exercising in a hot environment. This is a study that we did in, uh, in the mid-90s, looking at a group of athletes who went to uh, Florida for training. Uh, and the majority of them had spinal cord-related uh, disability, but there were a couple of visually impaired athletes as well. And what we did is after they arrived in this environment, we gave them deuterium oxide, which they ingested, and we s collected samples of urine over the next six days. And we recorded fluid input and urine output. And this was quite, quite fun that every athlete had a little measuring jug and they had to record their urine output every time they went. And uh, if anyone in the group challenged another athlete, if they didn't have their jug with them in their rucksack, they were penalized and there was a, there was a fine for that. So we got the group to work together to, uh, to, to make sure they were all doing it. And then we uh, analyzed the samples using in, in infrared spectrophotometry. It's a very simple uh, technique, relatively inexpensive, and from that we can calculate water turnover and uh, non-renal non loss. So this is just a graph showing decay in the D2O values in urine for these subjects over time. And this shows the water turnover in liters per day for these subjects, and showing that this is all above the, kind of the standard normal ranges reported in the literature. But to come on to uh, this water turnover comparative data, if you look at the standard physiology textbooks, they would talk about 2,500 to 3,000 liters per day. And John Leeper from Aberdeen had done a study in sedentary subjects in a, in a, not, uh, in a, a neutral environment and showed just over 3 liters per day and in exercising 4,600 uh, mils per day. And our, our subjects training in a hot environment exceeded that at 4.7 uh, 4 liters per day in water turnover. And we looked at non-urine loss, that's loss through sweat and, uh, um, and through uh, breathing. Uh, we could see that uh, there were significant non-urine losses in these subjects. And again, if we look at that in relation to uh, standard data, the standard data suggests the mean non-urine loss is about 1,000 mils per day, and yet the athletes with spinal cord injury exercising in that hot environment had twice that, um, uh, and the, for the judo players, it was three times that. 
So there are significant uh, um, amounts of fluid loss by Paralympic athletes exercising in a hot environment. So the fact that although they had a spinal cord injury, which was affecting their sweat rates, it was still higher than we had previously thought. And the other thing I just want to quickly do before handing over is to talk about the effect of heat ex exposure on strength and skill sports. Because we often talk about endurance, but we forget about those sports where uh, the skill and the power is really important. This was a study where we looked at a group of archers in a, uh, 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 in, uh, which involves strength and skill, and we looked at their target shooting and, the, and their scores every five minutes during a period of exposure um, to three different tests. One was for two hours in a temperature of 22 degrees, 40% humidity, and we gave them 200 mils of plain water every 30 minutes. For the other one, we, we, we heated up the temperature to 33%, uh, 33 degrees uh, Celsius, 70% humidity, and we gave them fluid. And for the last trial, we gave them the same um, environmental conditions, but no fluid. I'll skip through that one, just change in body weight. So if we look at this, those, when they didn't have the fluid replacement, we can see how they lost weight uh, over that period of time, while those ingesting the fluids managed to maintain it. And their heart rate increased for those who didn't have the fluid. But also, most importantly for athletes over time, the scores that they were able to achieve deteriorated without fluid replacement. So competing in a hot environment without fluid impacted on their ability to perform their archery to the same degree. So before I hand over, exercise and heat is a challenge for all athletes, but there are specific challenges for parallel athletes with specific impairments. Maintaining hydration, controlling core temperature can be very challenging. So we need strategies to prevent, monitor, detect, and unfortunately, if necessary, to treat them.